So it is my great pleasure to welcome Ziv AG from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where he is a PhD student in computer science. Um, and he is going to give the last talk of this semester in the One World Seminar on the dual of the margin, improved analysis rates uh, for implicit bias of gradient descent. Thank you, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So I will talk about joint works with my advisor, Matthias Telgaski. So here is an overview of this talk. As the title suggests, uh, we'll discuss implicit bias of gradient descent. So it means that we want to understand uh, why gradient descent can implicitly regularize the training process, regularize the training process, and find simple solutions that have a good generalization. And one specific goal we are interested in is proving gradient descent can find large margins, and here margin could be interpreted as a confidence level. So I will, I will discuss uh, margin maximization in detail later, but roughly speaking, uh, the reason to focus on margin is that there are, are both empirical and direct evidence that a large margin will lead to a good generalization. And uh, we'll see that indeed gradient descent can maximize a margin in many, in many interesting cases, including many non-convex cases. Specifically in this talk, we will discuss both linear predictors and deep networks. For linear predictors, we will uh, prove minority rates for margin maximization and hard margin SBM. So in other words, we can prove that the simple algorithm gradient descent can already achieve the current fastest hard margin SBM rate, while all prior rates are round versus group T at best. On the other hand, for deep networks, we will prove two general uh, implicit bias results called alignment and directional convergence. And uh, we will see that they can be viewed as two conceptual meta theorems for implicit bias because they uh, generalize and they generalize and uh, strengthen many prior results, and they can also imply new implicit bias results. And more interestingly, these two, even though these two settings look quite different, actually the two analyses are linked by a common new proof technique called, um, uh, which uses the dual perspective, and therefore may, Therefore, our uh, new dual proof technique could be very useful in the analysis of implicit bias. Okay, so this is a very brief overview. And next I will introduce the background and then discuss the implicit bias for linear networks and deep net for, for linear predictors and deep networks respectively. Okay, so we can start a supervised learning setting where we have a prediction model phi x w and uh, x denotes the input feature and w denotes the model parameter. So for each input feature x, there is a label y and we want the output of the model to match the label y. Formally, we want a small test error. We assume that there is a, there's, a, there's an underlying draw distribution p on the feature x and label y and the test error is just defined as the expected loss on this distribution. And here L denotes the loss function. It measures how different the true label Y is from the output of the model. On the other hand, in practice, we usually don't know this distribution P, but instead we can sample, we can have a, we can sample a training set from this distribution and, minima, and minimize the training error. It is denoted by R hat and it's just defined as the average loss over the training set. So with this framework, with this framework, we can consider the problems of optimization and generalization. For optimization, we just want to minimize the training error R hat. So R hat is usually non-convex in deep learning, but uh, it is observed in practice that simple algorithms like gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent can usually already minimize uh, the training error. And uh, there have been lots of analysis of gradient descent in the literature using the ideas of you neurotangent know, kernel, the mean field, et cetera. On the other hand, we can also consider the problem, we also need to consider the problem of generalization, which means that we want to prove the difference between the test error and the uh, training error is small. So there are actually two ways to get good generalization. One is to, one is to do explicit regularization, which means that Instead of 
minimizing the training error ahead, we actually also add an add an explicit regularizer to the training error. And uh, so there are many possible regularizers, such as RayDK, which is just L2 regularization, and L1 regularization, uh, and so on. On the other hand, we could also uh, try to explore certain implicit bias or implicit regularization properties of the training algorithm. For example, it is observed in practice that a uh, green descent GD or stochastic green descent SGD can surely find simple low training error solutions that also have good generalization. Therefore, we want to understand the um, such implicit bias and regularization properties of gradient descent. And one specific goal, as we mentioned before, is, uh, is margin maximization. And it is motivated by generalization bounds using the notion of margin. In this talk, we focus on the binary classification problem. Uh, in this case, the label Y is either minus one or plus one, denoting two classes. And in this case, we can define the unnormalized margin on the ice example. Uh, it is denoted by PI and it's just defined as YI times phi XI W. In other words, it is just the uh, true label times the output of the network. So we want uh, the notion of margin is useful here because, um, so first of all, as I just mentioned, we want the output of the network to match the true label. And in the binary classification setting, it just means that we want the output of the network to have the same sign as the true label. But to get a good generalization bound, to get a good test error bound, it is usually not enough for them to have the same sign. And actually we want the network, we want the model to have a, uh, to have a large confidence level and in the binary classification setting, this confidence level is just measured by this notion of margin because it is, this margin is kind of saying that how far the model is from the decision boundary zero. Specifically, we can prove this general uh, test error bound using the notion of margin. We can prove that for, we can prove that with probability one minus delta over the random sampling of the training data uh, for any real value P the probability of mis misclassification on the on the underlying distribution p, which means that the probability that uh, the network the, the output of the model has a different sign from the true label over the underlying distribution p, can be bounded by uh, the empirical probability over the training over the training set that uh, p i is less than or equal to p plus a certain complex measure of the function space divided by p square root n, uh, plus a term which comes from the random sampling of the data and which goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So from this bound, we can see that intuitively, if we can prove that a, an algorithm can make pi's larger, then we could hope to get a better test error bound so that's why we want to um, analyze margin maximization. And uh, just one more tricky thing here. Uh, so if we just want to make PS larger, usually we could just scale up the, the parameters of the model and this could usually just make PS larger. But this is not enough because if we scale up the parameter of the model, then the complex measure will also increase. So the correct quantity to consider is actually a certain normalized margin. And uh, this normalization term is different in different settings. And I will give concrete, concrete examples later, but roughly we just want to prove that GD and SGD can find a large normalized margin, or even we want to prove that they can globally maximize the normalized margin. And uh, if we can prove such results, then we can just invoke this general test error bound and, uh, and answer the question that why uh, GD and SGD can give good generalization. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, background. Uh, is there any questions so far? Okay, cool. So next I will, uh, I'm going to discuss the implicit bias for linear predictors. So uh, a linear predictor is very simple. It is just the inner product between the input X and the uh, model parameter W. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, in this case, the training error is also convex. So the analysis is uh, relatively easier. And we are still interested in linear predator because uh, it is first related to many important methods such as boosting and kernel methods. And specifically, it is related to neural tangent kernel, which is very popular recently. And uh, we will also see that actually many, many analysis in the linear setting actually also work for deep networks. And thus the linear setting is actually a very good source for intuition and proof techniques. And for simplicity in this talk, we are focused on the, on the exponential loss, which is also heavily used in boosting. So given the true label Y and the input X and the model parameter W, the exponential loss is just given by e to the minus y times the inner product between x and w. And uh, here we focus on the exponential loss only for simplicity. And uh, our analysis also, work, also works for the logistic loss, which is more widely used. Uh, and we consider standard gradient descent on the empirical, on the empirical risk on the training error. And, uh, the train, I also give the explicit form of the training error here. It is defined in exactly the same way, but just for linear predictors. Okay. And we are also interested in the linear separable case, which means that there exists a linear predictor U, which can give the correct sign on every training example. And here I'm also showing a very simple two-dimensional uh, linear separable example, where uh, we have this blue positive points and red negative points. And uh, in this case, a perfect classifier can just be given by minus one zero. So the linear separability assumption is very strong because it is uh, basically not, it is not satisfied by most real world data set. Uh, on the other hand, this uh, linear separability, separability could be extended to, for example, NTK separability very naturally because I mean, it could just be linear separability in the NDK RKHS, in the NDK reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And here I'm showing a two-dimensional example, which couldn't be linearly separated, uh, which couldn't be separated by a 2D linear predictor, but uh, which can be separated using the NDK features. And I'm also showing the contours of the, of the predictor we, uh, we learned using the NDK features. So now we can formally define the notion of margin. And uh, so the normalized margin of the linear predictor W is just defined as the minimum of yi times the inner product between xi and w divided by the L2 norm of w. And here we just use the L2 norm of w as the normalization term because this makes the notion of margin independent of the end of w. And we can also define the L2 max margin gamma bar just as the maximum possible margin that could be achieved by a unit norm a linear predictor. And uh, we also let U bar denote the L2 max margin solution. And we can also prove that U bar is unique. Now we can state our main result. Uh, without, loss of gen without loss of generality, we start from the zero initialization. And the interesting part is that we use an aggressive step size schedule. We let the step size eta t be the inverse training error. And if, if we use such an aggressive step size, then we can prove that the exact margin of the green design trait wt can be maximized to the L2 max margin gamma bar at a vulnerable t rate. And moreover, for almost all training data, the the distance between the normalized green design rate and the L2 max margin solution is also minimized to zero at a vulnerable T rate. So this is our main result for the linear case. And uh, here are some comments on prior work. So there have been lots of, hard, uh, lots of SEM solvers and uh, for all first order hard margin SEM solvers, they actually, they could, uh, achieve at best vulnerable screw T margin rates. This include uh, standard SBM solvers and uh, normalized perceptron. There are also prior works which analyze the step size vulnerable, vulnerable uh, the product of square root T and the training error. Uh, 
uh, this step size has been analyzed for boosting and for steepest, steepest descent, which include uh, gradient descent. However, because they use this less aggressive step size, they could only prove boundary scrutiny rate. And, uh, and I will discuss later that basically their proof technique couldn't handle the more, the more aggressive step size, which we use in our paper. And therefore, their proof couldn't get the vulnerability rate. Uh, on the other hand, for the boosting problem for L1 margin maximization, uh, we can also apply Nestor's accelerated gradient descent method to a, to a certain uh, uh, variable epsilon smooth approximation of the margin function. So this method could get epsilon additive error using Marvel epsilon iterations. Uh, however, I mean, so in, in some sense, uh, this method is, is also giving a variable T rate. But on the other hand, uh, for a different epsilon, this method would need a different smooth approximation, a different objective function. And uh, it may not be clear in advance what is a good epsilon. On the other hand, our result shows that a simple logistic regression and gradient descent can, just with an aggressive step size schedule, can already give the current fastest first order hard margin SBM solver. Uh, okay, so I, okay, so I also want to mention that the initial study of uh, implicit bias by surgery at all considered a constant step size eta t, and they proved tight variable log t margin maximization and the implicit bias rates. And this setting is perhaps more relevant, more relevant to current deep learning practice because. In practice, people usually uh, decrease step size. They don't increase it. Uh, on this point, I want to mention that our analysis is actually general enough. It can handle both constant eta t and aggressive eta t. And uh, for constant eta t, our analysis will also give the our log t rates. Uh, and on the other hand, it is interesting to see if we can make our aggressive step size schedule work, or like some maybe some some step size schedule in between working practice. Uh, is there any question about our results so far? OK, so next I will uh, briefly discuss the proof ideas of our paper. So I'm, I'm going to first discuss the proof ideas of margin maximization from prior work because it is, uh, I mean, we also use many of these ideas in our paper and I also discuss uh, why their analysis couldn't get the variability rates and how our analysis improved uh, prior, prior results. So the, uh, the, old, uh, the, the prior margin maximization analysis is based on this notion of unnormalized smooth margin. So it, uh, this quality has been used for a long time but this, not, this, this name of smooth margin was uh, introduced by Liu and Li. And uh, it is denoted by alpha. And uh, it is just given by L inverse, where L is the loss function. Here it is just e exponential function, or e to the minus d function. And uh, it is just defined as L, L inverse applied to n times the training error. Or it, it is just L inverse applied to the sum of loss the sum, uh, without, without error reaching. And for the exponential loss, it is basically just log sum x applied to the unnormalized margin. So we also have two uh, minus signs because um, because uh, log sum x uh, is an approximation of the maximum function. But here we want to extract the minimum unnormalized margin of the training set. So we have two additional minus signs. So it is called a smooth margin because it is a smooth approximation of the true unnormalized margin. And in fact, the difference between them could just be bounded by log n. So using this notion of smooth margin, uh, prior analysis basically um, try to show try try to show that uh, so alpha t increases to infinity, and it increases almost as fast as gamma bar times the L2 norm of W t. So if we can prove this result, then basically you can prove that alpha wt divided by the norm, of the, the norm of wt converges to gamma bar. And then we just need to apply the smooth approximation property. And we can get that the exact normalized margin also converges to gamma bar. Uh, 
So to, uh, to finish this proof, then we need to lower bound this smooth margin alpha wt. And prior works just use primal, just use the smoothness of this smooth margin function. But if we use this method, we will need to bound the error term, which comes from uh, the smoothness inequality. And it turns out that this error term is very large. And if we try to use the aggressive step size we use, which is the inverse training error, then this, I mean, then using this uh, method, we could only prove, I mean, using the primal smoothness, we could only prove convergence to a suboptimal margin. So to kill this error term, this error term, they have to, uh, prior work has, uh, has to use uh, this one over square root t times the, the training error step size. And uh, in this way, they can only get one over square root t, right? Next, I'm going to discuss our new analysis, which is focused on, which is based on the dual. So let me first define the dual variable. Uh, recall that we let PT denote the unnormalized margin. And uh, in this case, PTI is just uh, defined as YI times, oh, sorry, I forgot a T here, but PTI is just defined as YI times uh, phi XI WT, like, or like the product of the label and the output, output of the network at step T. And for linear predictors, it is just given by YI times the inner product between XI and WT. So, uh, with the unnormalized margin PT, the dual variable QT is just given by the softmax mapping over PT. So this, this uh, dual variable QT is very natural and important in the, in the implicit bias analysis because although it is defined using the primary trace using the unnormalized margin, actually we can prove the update from QT to QT plus one is a mirror descent update with entropy on this dual objective function G defined here. So this G is basically the square of the L2 norm of uh, the sum of QIY XI. And uh, it is very related to the max, to the L2 max margin. And we can actually prove that the minimum of G is given by gamma bar square. Here the domain we're considering is just uh, the probability simplex because the dual variable defined here is a probability vector. And uh, using this dual function, using this dual um, mirror descent update, we can actually prove a lower bound on alpha t, uh, which is much faster and tighter. And uh, with our lower bound on alpha t actually matches the upper bound up to an, an additive constant. So remember that alpha t, alpha w t goes to infinity. And uh, so it is, so our, and our lower bound can actually match the upper bound only up to an additive constant. So it means that our lower bound is very tight. And this is, and this is basically why we can get the variety t margin maximization rates. So like to sum up, basically our analysis is both a primal and a dual and gives uh, the variety t margin rate. So not only our variety t rate is very fast and also this combination of primal, dual, primal and dual proof technique could also be very useful. So, oh, I also want to mention that this dual, uh, this dual objective function G is useful not only in the linear setting, actually a more general version of G will also be useful in our analysis of deep networks in the nonlinear setting, which makes G even more interesting. Okay, so this is the end of the discussion of linear predictors. Uh, is there any question? Um, if I can ask, so if you don't make the assumption that your data is linearly separable, can you mm -hmm. have some version where you converge to say the best possible predictor, the lowest loss predictor with a given rate? Lowest loss. So I'm not sure about that part, but so uh, our dual analysis doesn't, uh, actually doesn't require linear separability. And uh, so, Without linear separability, the minimum of G would just be zero, but we can still prove like a, a dual convergence. We can prove that G, G, Q, T actually converges to the minimum of G. Uh, this part doesn't require linear separability, but uh, without dual convergence, like the, our primal study wouldn't make sense because I mean, our primal, our primal rate is our margin maximization. If the margin is 
without linear separability, the margin is zero. So uh, the primal part maybe wouldn't make sense. But uh, uh, yeah, as, actually, I guess that's my current answer. But like the dual part doesn't require separability, so it could also be useful, maybe in some way. Makes sense. Thank you. OK. Oh, there is a question that is the margin still well defined in the long, in the non-linearly separable case. So actually, uh, Matthias and I had a paper in twenty eighteen, which studied the general case uh, without linear separability. In that case, we can basically show that you can always decompose. I mean, for any training data, you can decompose it into two parts, where one part is uh, kind of separable and the other part is um, is a uh, Kind of like strongly non-separable, and you can actually, I mean, for that part, you can actually, you can actually find a unique minimizer of the empirical risk, and uh, in this way, uh, we could define margin. I mean, maybe just we can just consider margin on the separable part, but uh, yeah, that's one possible way to define margin. But uh, we haven't even, we haven't really tried to like combine the techniques in this paper and uh, and our old paper and our old results. Hadzu, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so in this work, you use a learning rate uh, proportional to one over the current empirical loss, loss right? Yes. So yes. What, what can happen if you use a larger learning rate? Even larger? Uh, if we use an even larger learning rate, then our analysis wouldn't work uh, because like the, we, we still need to have, like, so here I mentioned that uh, our lower bound matches the upper bound up to an active constant, even if we use this uh, one over empirical risk, one over training error step size. But if we use an even larger step size, then I would imagine that this, this error term will just like, will just blow up and uh, become, it may be hard to control it. And this, that's why we have, that's why we can only use this one over, one over uh, training error step size. So uh, uh, one more question. Question. So is is this one over uh, one over step size? Uh, does it basically come from the smooth uh, smoothness of the ob objective fun uh, function? Does it does it scale like one one uh, one over r? That's why we can take this one over r fact factor. Is that over thing? r? Yeah, actually, yeah, indeed. Like as I mentioned, uh, let me see. Yeah, if we only use the smoothness of the smooth margin, then actually we couldn't use one over r because, as I mentioned here, actually prior works basically use this idea. They use the smoothness of the of this smooth margin function of the log sum x function. But if we only use this part, then we couldn't actually use one over r. And if we, I mean, we could try to use one over r with the. I mean, we could try to only use the smoothness of the of the smooth Margin function, but if we then apply this one over r learning rate, then we would only be able to prove convergence to a suboptimal margin. We wouldn't, we couldn't prove convergence to the L two max margin gamma bar. And to prove exact margin maximization, uh, we can only use one over one over uh, square root t times r learning rate. I mean, so like if we only use the smoothness of the of the smooth margin, then we could only do we can only uh, use one over screw t r learning rate, and if we want to use one over r and to get the one over t rate, we must also use the dual part. Or like in our proof, we also use a dual part, and that's why we can prove this faster rate on alpha. I mean, faster than what we can prove only with the smoothness of alpha. Okay, so I will then discuss the implicit bias for deep networks. So let us first uh, start from the start from some warm up, warm up cases. We can first consider the special case of le of deep linear networks. In this case, the input feature X is just mapped to uh, the product of L weight matrices and the input X. So we can see that a deep linear network can still only represent a linear predictor. Uh, but on the other hand, in this case, the training error becomes non-convex 
and it seems that training would be harder with deep linear networks. And for simplicity, we consider gradient flow, which is defined as a solution to the differential equation given here. And uh, so gradient flow could just be thought of as a gradient descent with infinitesimal step sizes, or it, is, it could just be thought of as a limit of gradient descent as we let the step size go to zero. And uh, one natural question we could ask, or like one possible goal we would uh, try to prove is, uh, uh, is margin maximization, even with such non-convex uh, objective function, even much with such non-convex training error. And formally, it means that we uh, want to prove that the product, I mean, if we can start the, uh, if we can start the function computed by this network, which is just given by the product of all weight matrices, then we want to show that uh, uh, this function also converges to this L2 max margin direction. And here is an em empirical illustration. We can start the same uh, two-dimensional linearly separable data. And uh, yeah, if we first consider a vanilla case, which is just a usual linear predictor, then indeed it converges to the L2 max margin direction. On the other hand, even if we consider a four layer deep linear network, and if we plot the uh, pro pro product of all the weight matrices, then still this product converges to the L2 max margin direction. And indeed margin maximization with deep linear networks can be proved. It is first proved by Gunaseka et al. Uh, by assuming directional convergence of the model parameters wt and uh, directional convergence of some gradients. Here, directional convergence basically means that uh, the limit, uh, the directional convergence of the weights wt means that the limit of wt over the Frobenius sum of wt exists. In other words, the result uh, assumes that the normalized uh, model parameters converges to some point. So later we also studied a uh, margin maximization for deep linear networks and our result don't need uh, such convergence assumptions, but uh, we need some other technical conditions. And in later we'll see that using techniques in our current paper, we can actually prove margin maximization for deep linear, for deep linear networks without any such uh, convergence assumptions or other technical assumptions. And in fact, uh, one interesting point to mention is that we can actually prove even more than much maximization for deep linear networks. So here I'm presenting our uh, I'm presenting one query of our uh, of our nearest result, and uh, it I mean a slightly weaker form has already been proved in our old 2018 paper, but here this version is just uh, more simple and uh, stronger. So we can prove that there exists unique vectors VL to V0, where VL is just, uh, is just one, it's just the real value one, and V0 is the L2 max margin direction U bar. And we can prove that uh, the normalized J weight matrix just converges to VJ, VJ minus one transpose. In other words, we can prove that uh, each weight matrix converges to a rank one matrix and uh, and uh, adjacent weight matrix uh, asymptotically have the same top singular vectors and that's why we call that that's why we call it alignment because it is saying that uh, adjacent adjacent weight matrix uh, kind of become aligned to each other they have the same uh, top uh, eigenvectors so so intuitively, this is saying that even though a deep linear network is a highly over highly over parameterized model, then I mean actually gradient descent doesn't actually gradient descent can learn a very simple structure. It actually only learns a uh, rank one matrix and also adjacent matrix have the same top singular vectors. So this could be interpreted as a very strong implicit bias, implicit regularization property. And we will see that this actually this kind of alignment. Uh, follows from our general alignment result, which holds for general deep homogeneous networks. Okay, so the second warm-up case is two homogeneous networks, and uh, specifically here we consider uh, 
a shallow square value network. And uh, the output of the network is just defined as the sum of uh, SJ sigma WJ transpose square. And sigma denotes the ReLU activation. And here we consider sigma square, which is square ReLU. And because square ReLU is already too homogeneous, so we, we just let the, the weights from the second layer be either plus one or minus one, and we don't train them in the, we don't train them during training. And uh, here is uh, another illustration. We uh, train a two layer square root network on the same two dimensional data. And here are the controls of the predictors during, tra during the training process. And uh, we can also ask a question whether gradient descent can maximize the margin to the infinite width maximum, uh, the maximum possible infinite width margin. And here we use the, the square of the norm of WT as the normalization term because we're in a too homogeneous setting. And indeed, uh, margin maximization has been proved by Stutt and Bach for infinite width networks, assuming still the directional convergence of the weights. And also they assume the convergence of the dual rival QT. Here, the dual rival is defined in exactly the same way as we just did, uh, but it's just defined for now for two layer network, for two layer, two, for two homogeneous networks. So we can see that uh, to sum up, there have been lots of implicit bias results for gradient descent in the literature, but many of them actually assume uh, some kind of uh, uh, convergence, such as directional convergence of the model parameters. And, uh, but it is not clear whether this is true or how to prove it. So in this work, I'm going to present best to prove two general implicit bias results uh, one is directional convergence and the another one is called alignment. And uh, we basically view them as meta theorems for implicit bias because um, they can imply many existing and new implicit bias results. Okay, so next I'm going to uh, discuss our setting. Uh, we consider positive homogeneous networks, which means that, or, or like actually any general positive homogeneous model uh, it means that there exists a positive constant L such that for any positive constant C, phi x C w is equal to C to the L phi x w. Uh, it means that if we scale the parameter of the model by a constant C, then the output of the model will be scaled by C to the L. Uh, positive hom homogeneity actually allows many common layers used in deep learning, such as uh, fully connected and convolutional layers. ReLU and leaky ReLU, max and average pooling, et cetera. And specifically, if we consider a depth L net, uh, fully connected or convolutional ReLU network without any skip connection, then it is L positively homogeneous. On the other hand, positive homogeneity excludes some other common components such as skip connections and some non-homogeneous activations such as ERU, and it is a very interesting open problem to see if our results can be extended to general non-homogeneous models. So uh, homogeneous models has been ex extensively studied in the prior work by Liu and Li. However, even uh, uh, proving directional convergence for homogeneous models is still tricky because uh, Liu and Li actually gave a counterexample, which is uh, called a uh, homogeneous Mexican hat which is uh, positively homogeneous and uh, which can be CK, which uh, C to the K means that it can have a case order continuous derivative, but still directional convergence fails. Uh, and uh, it means that proving directional convergence is actually very tricky. So only assuming uh, differentiability is not enough. So like a uh, railway is actually not the problem for, uh, for, the, um, for a directional convergence to fail. Therefore, we need the notion of O minimal definability. Uh, the exact definition of O minimal definability is kind of complicated, but I would say it is a mild technical condition because uh, it allows almost all different architectures and specifically it allows all homogeneous functions uh, we define here. And uh, actually we also put a theorem in our paper that uh, O minimal definability can even handle non-homogeneous functions such as skip connections and ERU and so on. So 
O minimal defined entity does ex exclude certain functions such as periodic activations like the sine function, but still uh, it would allow most uh, functions used in current deep learning. Okay, so now we can state our main results. Uh, we assume that the network is positively homogeneous and O minimally definable. And uh, we also assume that, uh, I will also discuss this later, but I, we also assume that the initial risk is already very small. The initial risk is, or the initial, uh, oh, sorry, here, I'm using a different, a wrong notation. I sh it should be R hat W zero here. We basically assume that the initial training error is already very small. It is below bar per n. And uh, in this case, we can prove that uh, the gradient flow iterate wt converges in direction, which means that uh, the limit of wt over the Frobenius norm of wt exists. And second is the, our general alignment property. We can prove that the iterate wt and the negative gradient of the, uh, of the uh, training error become aligned and they are become aligned to each other, which formally means that the angle between WT and uh, the negative gradient of the training error be, uh, converges to zero. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry again for the typo here. It should be, it should be R hat W zero less than one over N. So this condition was first introduced by Liu and Li and kind of it is saying that we already have a uh, I mean, at initialization, the, the network, the deep homogeneous model can already separate the training, uh, the training set. Okay. It can already give the correct sign on every training example. So it is kind of a strong condition, but on the other hand, it could be ensured by any early phase analysis such as new attention kernel. And we could just use such an analysis to ensure this initial condition and then apply our analysis, our late phase analysis and kind of our point is to, um, to understand like uh, what kind of implicit bias when it sound will learn like in the late phase of training, if we, which means that if we train network for a long enough time and hopefully we can uh, try to prove certain global margin maximization results, which could be uh, hard to prove in the initial phase, in the early phase of training. Um, can I uh, just verify one or N? Mm -hmm is the number of data samples that you've got? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, sorry, I should mention Thank it again. You. N is the number of data, uh, N is the size of the training set, the number of training examples. Okay. Okay, so here are some comments. Uh, our result called for all homogeneous defined bound networks. And uh, as I mentioned before, as I present our corollaries just now, uh, our general result, results could imply margin maximization for deep linear networks. And for, for two-layer two, for two square root networks, uh, our result could also imply margin maximization under an additional covering condition. Uh, and uh, very recently, in Yun Nan 2020, they also used our uh, directional convergence and the Lyman results to analyze uh, general linear tensor networks. Okay, and uh, uh, is there any question about our results so far? Otherwise I will uh, briefly discuss the proof ideas and uh, that will be the end of my talk. So just one que uh, question. So uh, then these uh, results also imply that the gradients can converge in di di direction, right? Because you are yes, saying yes. that weights and gradients are in. Okay, fine. Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to discuss the proof ideas. Uh, so here for directional convergence, we can uh, we use the same smooth normalized margin and uh, it's defined exactly in the same way as a linear case. It's just defined now for general nonlinear models. And we can also define the normalized version of the uh, smooth margin. It is denoted by alpha tilde here. And the normalization term is just the, the Frobenius norm of W raised to the power of L. So this normalization makes sense here because we're considering an L positively homogeneous model. And uh, if we scale up the parameter by C, the output of, net of the model will be scaled by C to the L. So 
it makes sense to use this uh, Frobenius norm of W to the L normalization term. It was proved in the prior work by Liu and Li that uh, if we run gradient flow on this problem, then the normalized uh, smooth margin alpha wt, uh, alpha tilde wt is non-decreasing and it converges to some value gamma. So for the actual convergence, we, the key quantity we are analyzing is this delta t here. It is, denote, it is defined as the, the, the length of the path swept by this normalized iterate from time zero to t. So this normalized iterate wt over the Frobenius sum of wt is a point on the L2 unit sphere. And uh, as, we doing, as we keep doing gradient flow, this would sweep a path on this unit sphere. And we just let delta t denote the length of this path. And uh, basically, we can prove that uh, for large enough t, or uh, if we train that the model for long enough time, such that wt, the norm of the norm of wt is large enough, so it could guarantee this because the norm of wt converges to infinity. And if the difference between gamma and alpha tilde wt is small enough, so this could also be guaranteed because uh, we can prove that alpha tilde t converges to a certain value gamma. Then we can show that d zeta t dt can be bounded by d psi alpha tilde dt, where psi is some increasing function. And because we can prove this general inequality, basically we can prove that the length of delta t is bounded. And uh, if we can prove that, yeah, the length of delta t, uh, sorry, we can prove that delta t is bounded. In other words, the length of the path swept by the normalized iterate is bounded. And therefore the normalized iterate converges to some point, which is exactly directional convergence. And the hardest part is to prove the existence of such increasing function psi. And here we need to use the O minimal theory. And uh, specifically, we have to prove some, we have to prove new definability results and also unbounded non smooth political wire sewage inequalities. There have been some prior results uh, on this, uh, in this area. But uh, we couldn't use their we couldn't use prior results directly because uh, either they couldn't handle non-smooth objective functions, which is uh, uh, which is not which is not ideal in our case because we are dealing with ReLU and uh, uh, max pooling, or prior results couldn't handle the exponential function. But in our case, we are using uh, the exponential loss or the logistic loss, so we couldn't. That's why we couldn't use prior results directly, and we actually have to prove many new definability and KR inequalities. On the other hand, for alignment, as I mentioned before, actually we use, we can extend uh, this, the, oh yeah, here, sorry, the, it may be confusing, but basically we can extend the dual objective in a linear setting to the general setting. So, oh yeah, it's actually very bad because like uh, I've missed a sum here, sorry. So uh, basically in a linear case, our dual, potential is the square of the L2 norm of the sum of QIY XI. But in the general case, we can just, what we need to do is just to replace XI by the gradient of, of phi divided by the Frobenius norm of WT raised to the power of L minus one. So uh, in the linear case, because L is equal to one, then the, denomin uh, then the denominator, then the normalization term is just one and the gradient of phi is just given by xi. So indeed, in a linear case, our general dual potential just reduced to our old uh, dual potential for linear, for linear setting. On the other hand, for the general non-linear setting, we would need to consider this general dual potential. And indeed, it is used to ensure stability of the gradient. And, uh, uh, and then we can prove kind of that the gradients also converge to some direction and indeed it's, it, and it actually converges to a same direction as the model parameters. Okay, so that's the end of this talk. And here is the, it's a summary of this, of our results. And uh, uh, I'm happy to take any question.